Today is our final presentation on our month-long series, Commonwealth Changed, Massachusetts and the Civil War, remembering the sesquicentennial of the Civil War in Massachusetts. It has been wonderful to collaborate on this series with Boston National Historical Park, and we've been so fortunate to work with their rangers to put this anniversary series together. More than 20,000 African Americans served in the Union Navy during the Civil War. Today we welcome Boston National Historical Park Ranger Bill Casey as he shares the inspiring true stories of two of these men. We will learn of the bravery of Medal of Honor recipient John Lawson who, wounded by enemy shell, held his post, supplying the guns aboard the USS Hartford with ammunition, and of William B. Gould I, an escaped slave whose provocative war diary tells the tale of life at sea aboard the USS Cambridge and the USS Niagara. Please join me in welcoming Bill Casey. Thank you. As Jamie just introduced to you, my name is Bill Casey, and I have been with the National Park Service for more than 15 years, but I'm not a native to Boston. I was born and bred in the city of Philadelphia, and it's there really in many ways where this journey began for me as a small boy, because a block away from where I grew up, was the Philadelphia National Cemetery. And every Memorial Day, I would go there to pay my respects to my grandfather, who served in the US Army in that war to end all wars. But as an eight-year-old boy, curiosity always gets the better of you. And I decided to look around and see who else was there. And as I walked through the row of marble stones, I looked at their names their places of birth, and in some cases, where they eventually died. And I saw people that had served in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, those who had perished during the Vietnam conflict, to those that reached all the way back to the Civil War. And less than about 40 yards away from where my grandfather rests today, I saw older headstones. The marble was a little worn. But on there it stated, members of various units, and their initials of the unit was USCT. Now, as an eight-year-old boy, I didn't fully understand that. But later, when I became an adult, and I was pursuing my interest in history, I looked it up, and it simply meant United States Colored Troop. Well, they arrested not far from my grandfather, 66 individuals, they were of African-American descent. So certainly, my story began a long time ago as a small boy and continues. And this is certainly a timely topic. The year is 2011, but 150 years ago, we were in the midst of the Civil War. So we've often heard about the contribution of the 54th Massachusetts, certainly a very important one. But we also had a Navy, and that's what this topic is going to discuss. And it's, of course, going to go into talking about the contribution of those of the African-American community who, when given their chance to prove that they were willing and able to fight both free men and former slaves of the African-American community, would take a stand for the nation just like their descendants did during the days of the Revolution. And you see above here on this particular slide a quote from William B. Gould. Now, William B. Gould in many ways is an extraordinary individual. His story is like many, but fortunately for us, William B. Gould kept a diary, which was published in the last 10 years by his great-grandson. And the title of the book, the Diary of a Contraband. Well, William B. Gould used the term in his diary, defending the holiest of all causes, liberty and union. Very interesting words if you ever go into Faneuil Hall and you look at the painting of no other than Daniel Webster, where under that painting, the words are inscribed, liberty and union, now and forever. But no doubt Mr. Gould couldn't have met Mr. Webster. But think about it. Two different men believing in the same concept. Whoops. 
Well, lo and behold, we need to go back and talk a little bit about, though, what the Navy was doing during the American Civil War. And this is a direct quote from Abraham Lincoln. He wanted us to remember what the Navy did. And as he states in his particular, excuse me, description here, he talks about how the Navy performed on the high seas, the Gulf, the Mississippi, all encompassing around the southern part of the United States during the actual conflict. So we do have to ask ourselves a series of simple questions about this. First, what was the naval strategy of the Union in the war? Second, what resources were needed for that naval war? Third, what were the benefits of enlisting African Americans in the Union Navy? And fourth, who served? Where were they from? And how many did enlist? And finally, what were the contributions of those individuals? Well, with regards to resources, first of all, the United States Navy was very small in the 1860s. It comprised less than 90 vessels. Some were scattered overseas, some were in the United States waters. So they had to expand it. That expansion would go up to 600 naval vessels. And less than a mile and a half away at the Charlestown Navy Yard, which is under the care of the National Park Service, that was one facility that was in the midst of that particular war, not only building new ships, but converting them locally. And from the harbor here would go forth many a famous ship that would stand up for the Union, such as the USS Hartford, which we'll hear a little bit later on. But besides doing new ship construction and ship conversion at public and private yards, you needed to expand your manpower. Now I'm going to draw your attention to this center picture here, where that is a recruiting poster, an original one. Do you think anyone was trying to have a sense of humor with this? Excursion party for the sunny south? This is 1861 we're talking about. This was for the enlisting in the Army. Notice they only said about nine months of enlistment needed. Did they fully comprehend in 1861 what was going to happen at such places like Antietam or Gettysburg? Many thought the war was going to be over in a matter of weeks or months at the most. Far from that would happen. But. You need a naval strategy first before you can increase your fleet. And this is where what comes into play, the Anaconda Plan. Now, this particular plan was very simple and was created by a general in the Army whose last name was Scott. You will encircle the Confederacy from the Chesapeake on down around the Florida Panhandle and then up the mighty Mississippi. And with that, you will strangle the economic system that will keep the southern armies alive. Time to let them wither on the vine. But you needed to increase the number of ships. You needed to increase the number of manpower. And that is where we'll get into our next topic, what were the benefits of enlisting African Americans in the Union Navy? Well, first, as I mentioned, you got a rising need for naval manpower. Second, you had escaped slaves who were entering Union lines or going on board Union ships. More about that with William B. Gould. And third, you're going to deny the Confederacy the use of contraband. I'll explain that to you in a moment. There's a very important location that recently has come under the care of the National Park Service, a former armor facility, army facility known as Fortress Monroe, which dates back into the early 19th century. Well, in 1861, 
He was one of the last bastions under the control of the Union Army. And at that time, there was a general by the name of Benjamin Franklin Butler, who was in charge of the facility. But he's faced with a dilemma. African-Americans who are escaping from slavery flock to the fort. What are you going to do? Turn them away? Take them in? Well, Butler did just that. He took them into the fortification. Hence, it becomes known as the Freedom Fortress. By taking them into the confines of that particular fort, General Butler is in direct violation of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, part of the Compromise of 1850, dealing with the issue of slavery. But certainly, Benjamin Butler had a conscience. He could not see turning human beings out into the cold. And what eventually will happen is this is how he will justify it. He will use the term contraband. Now, in wartime, contraband means this, supplies, equipment, anything that the enemy could use to their advantage. Well, slaves could have been used for the construction of fortifications, for making roads, for relieving Confederate soldiers of other duties in order for them to perform military activity. Butler created an excellent justification besides human needs. So what will end up happening is that you now have African Americans on board ships that escaped from shore. What are you going to do with them? Why not just enlist them into the service? And that's where our next question will be. Who served? Where were they from? And how many were enlisted? Well, the number, as far as we know, is somewhere between 18,000 to 20,000. Current research leans towards that. That's approximately 20% of the entire Navy's manpower force during the war. 20%. As opposed to the Army, which took in about, had about 10% of their numbers African Americans serving. Now, of those numbers, though, this is an interesting split. Over 7,000 were free men that enlisted from northern free states. Over 7,000 were born into slavery and escaped. And that could mean anywhere along the southeast coast or the Mississippi. And over 1,500 were born in Canada or in the Caribbean. Now, these individuals who were free men were not necessarily unfamiliar with serving at sea. For instance, the United States Navy did not ban African Americans prior to the Civil War, but they kept it at about 5%. African Americans have been serving in the naval forces since the Revolution, but they kept it to a low number. So as the war begins, there are several hundred African Americans already serving in the United States Navy. So they're familiar with the art and the science of being a good sailor. Look at the number, though, that came from outside of this country, 1,500. Now, they could possibly have been merchant marines, those in the private sector that decided to throw their hand in in helping to preserve the Union. An example of locations, too, where these enlistments took place. Between New York and Pennsylvania, over 1,200 free men enlisted. Look at the number for Maryland, 2,300. 400 from Massachusetts. Now, one of the reasons why Maryland had such a high number of African Americans enlist was because of no other than the waterways and the byways of the Chesapeake Bay. Again, you have people that already had experience. There was no real need to train them. But that gets us to the topic of Navy life. You'll notice and see my first quote there. Hours of boredom, moments of sheer terror. If there's anyone in this room that's ever been in the military 
and has been in the front lines or served anywhere in a hostile environment, you know what that means. Think about your environment that you are going to go into. Are ships big? Wait till you go on one. Go on the Constitution sometime. Constitution was around during the American Civil War, and it was similar to the types of vessels that they built. A ship as big as the Constitution requires several hundred people. You near need 300 to 400 people in an area that's about 350 feet long by about 50 feet wide. Can you put yourself in that environment? Try it sometime. Come on over to the Navy Yard. Visit the USS Constitution, or if you like, come on over and visit USS Cass and Young, a destroyer from the Second World War. Didn't matter whether it was the 19th or the 20th century. You want to get an idea what life on board ships are, come and visit us. We'll be happy to explain it. Hours of boredom, moments of sheer terror. Well, what are you doing in your hours of boredom? You have a routine. And yes, there are ways you can do it. You can do it right, you can do it wrong, or you can do it the Navy way. Which one do you think is going to come out on top every single solitary time? The Navy. And you have a captain who is the ultimate person in authority on board that ship. Nobody else. Your routine, though, will center around eating, sleeping, working, drilling, standing a watch. You know what standing a watch is like on board a naval ship off, let's say, Charleston during the Civil War? You're part of a blockade. You're looking and waiting for blockade runners. Well, your 24-hour operation. So you will wake up at around midnight. You now have the watch for the next four hours. You will go up in the mass or towards the bow, and you will stand there, and you will wait, and you will look in all sorts of weather, and you will stand your duty. As the minutes tick by, as the hours dredge on, until you're relieved four hours later. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Care to sign up? Care to go back 150 years? Care to experience that environment? But there's one thing that's very interesting in being on board a naval ship. Everybody is figuratively and literally in the same boat. Misery loves company. So, what were the contributions of African Americans to winning the war? What was the contribution of this 20,000 plus people coming together, being put in these environments in all sorts of weather? Well, the contribution is immense because what it helped the Union understand is that when those that were willing to stand up and fight for rights they did not have, they were fighting to obtain them. Now it would be impossible to go through 18 to 20,000 individuals. There are many, many stories. I'm only going to relate to you two of several. And the first one will be this gentleman, William B. Gould I. Look at his date of birth, 1837. He's a relatively young man in his 20s at the time. Born into slavery, he is then residing in Wilmington, North Carolina, 28 miles up the Cape Fear River is this major Confederate port. Off the coast is the Union forces, consisting of a variety of ships. One, the USS Cambridge, built here in Boston, outfitted at the Charlestown Navy Yard. It's on blockade duty. Well, William B. Gould in 1862 decides to take a gamble. And on the night of September 21st, 1862, him and seven other individuals 
will escape from bondage. Take a small craft and go down the Cape Fear River. Now this was at night, and I don't like to coin the phrase, it was a dark and stormy night, but it was. It was rainy, perfect cover. And as they slipped down the Cape Fear River, they had 28 miles to go to obtain freedom. And at any bend in that river, with various sentries located, that freedom or that attempt at freedom would have come to a quick end. But they were fortunate. They went undetected. And several hours later, they reached the sanctuary of the open sea, set sail, and are spotted by two ships of the Union Navy, one which will take them on board, USS Cambridge. Now, a few days previously, the commanding officer of the Cambridge was faced with a dilemma. He's low on men. So here is an excellent opportunity to take new crew members on and have them trained on the job. That was one of the interesting things about the Navy in the 19th century. You didn't go to boot camp. You basically enlisted, and you were given on-the-job training, and you were given a title. Well, when he served on board the USS Cambridge, he'll be known as what they classify as a first-class boy. Defining that in 19th century Navy Largan, it means you're an apprentice under the age of 18, but you have an opportunity to rise up in the ranks. And after a certain period of time, you would be known as a landsman. And a landsman is someone that will go through an apprenticeship that will last up to three years. Well, William B. Gould only served in the Navy up to 1865, and somewhere along the line, he transferred from being a landsman to a wardroom steward. But when he's on board the Cambridge, it is an exciting moment for that shipping crew because in, in working with other vessels of that blockade, they were able to snatch four Confederate blockade runners, driving another one ashore. But William B. Gould also points out in his diary the danger of being an African American in that type of environment. Where is he? He's off the enemy's coast. How close was he to possibly losing that well-earned freedom that he had? And he relates on one of the incidents that happened that they drove this schooner ashore, and lo and behold, they sent a group of men ashore to burn the schooner. Now, he wasn't with them, fortunately. But what happened is, as the crew members landed near the now ashore schooner, Confederates came out of the bush, captured the men. They're now prisoners. But if he had been part of that, that diary might have come to an end right then and there. And whether they were serving on the southeast Atlantic coast or up the Mississippi, you're deep in enemy territory. And to be captured serving the Union, if I was a free man, I'd be thrown into slavery, or worse. But he will change ships. He'll actually come here to Boston in 1863. He has a bad case of the measles. And William B. Gould has to go to the Chelsea Naval Hospital for a period of rest. There the diary ends. But in September of 1863, October, he now joins a new vessel the USS Niagara. And it's on board the Niagara, which is this ship depicted right there. And this was taken in Boston Harbor after she was outfitted at the Charlestown Navy Yard. He will now proceed far afield. He will be in European waters. He's still fighting the Confederacy. Him and his shipmates are now going after Confederate commerce raiders or Confederate warships that are being outfitted in European ports. And for the rest of the war, he will spend his time visiting such places as England, France, and Spain, tracking down and pursuing a variety of Confederate ships, 
one which they did capture, the state of Georgia. But his time in the Navy will come to an end. It's September of 1865. USS Niagara comes to the Charlestown Navy Yard. And it's there that he will be mustered out of the Navy at the now still standing building known as the Muster House. He'll settle in the Boston area, eventually down in Dedham. He will raise a large family. Six of his sons will go on to serve the country, both in the Spanish-American War as well as the First World War. They were definitely a family of fighters. William B. Gould's legacy is extraordinary in many ways not only for his diary, one of three that were written by former slaves during the war, but think about the contribution he made to this country. I believe in what this country stands for. I am willing to stand up for this country, and I'm willing to earn those rights the hard way. But as I mentioned, there is another individual, whoop, several, they will deal with the ultimate form of recognition by our government for military service, and that is no other than the Medal of Honor, which had its origins during the Civil War. Now, this is a listing of Medal of Honor recipients. Free men, former slaves, seven African Americans were presented with the Medal of Honor during the Civil War era. Four of them, as I highlighted here with the little asterisk, were all in the same battle, the Battle of Mobile Bay. And I will just highlight one particular individual here, and that is no other than John Lawson, a free man, a native of Philadelphia. He enlisted in the Navy there. He eventually will find his way on board Admiral Farragut's flagship, USS Hartford a Boston-built ship. And there, in August of 1864, at the Battle of Mobile Bay, he will earn, along with four others, our nation's highest military accommodation, the Medal of Honor. You'll see the quote from the, excuse me, you'll see the quote directly from his accommodation. He was seriously, excuse me, seriously wounded but remained in his battle station. He was below deck. He was part of an ammunition crew. He was wounded in both legs. Given the opportunity to go below, he refused. He believed he had a sense of duty, enabling the ship to accomplish its task. And in those days when battles were fought, it's very up close and personal. Now, this is a painting that was done after the war. And the artist is basically highlighting the leader, Admiral Farragut. And if you notice the way that this painting is aligned, your eyes more or less are drawn to one individual because Farragut did stand in the rigging. But in one respect, the artist captured Lawson's sense of sacrifice and commitment when you look down here to the gun deck. This gun crew here of about 12 individuals are just opposite the ship. Warfare in the 19th century is exceptionally up close and personal. No push buttons here, folks. You will see the enemy. You will smell the cordite and think about it. Can you imagine what the heat must have been like on that August morning in Mobile Bay? The guns are firing, the action is tight and close, and here, this gun crew, with its mixture of individuals from various ethnic groups, excuse me, as well as races, such as this particular gentleman here, an African American, are in the thick of the battle. Hence, this particular painting is more than just a dedication to Admiral Farragut. It reflects the sense of unity the Navy crews would have had in the thick of a battle. So in the last, <clears throat> excuse me, 20, 25 minutes that I've been doing this presentation, we've given you the briefest of glimpse with regards to that sense of dedication and sacrifice. 
And this particular quote that I have up here is from the commanding officer of the USS Minnesota. But he didn't give this quote at the end of the war. He gave it in March of 1862. And that is when, in March of 1862, the USS Monitor goes up against the US, excuse me, the CSS Virginia down off of Norfolk, Virginia. And there, after his ship had been driven aground, the USS Minnesota, well, he only had one particular gun mount, the pivot gun mount on the stern, that was fully manned by African Americans. They were the only gun crew that could bear their guns on the CSS Virginia. And as he stated, the Negroes fought energetically and bravely, none more so. They evidently felt that they were thus working out the deliverance of their race. Words to reflect upon, words to remember. And whether it was William B. Gould or whether it was John Lawson, their story is well worth reading, reflecting upon, and remembering as we commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We have uh, some questions. Yes. I'm going to Mobile in March. And uh, who won that battle? Because that, uh, the uh, focus is on the blue and the gray at sea. Union. Union Navy won that one. Was the Monroe Fortress on Chesapeake Bay? Yes. Yes. Okay. You go all the way down the Chesapeake Bay, the Hampton Roads area. Okay, it's as far as you can go. Uh, the fortification is now going through being demilitarized. The army is going to retain some aspects of it, but the actual fort itself will be under the care of the National Park Service, which we will be interpreting in time. We already have a superintendent, and if you're curious about that particular site, go to mps.gov on the internet. What was the strength of the Confederate Navy? There is no real Navy as we could see today. Bear in mind, whatever the Confederate Navy was at that time was basically vessels that were taken over from the Union Navy. Example, we all heard about the CSS Virginia. Well, the CSS Virginia was formerly known as the USS Merrimack, a Boston-built ship new, actually, only a few years old. 1850s, she's launched here in the Charlestown Navy Yard. She's in what is then known as Gosport Navy Yard, now known as Norfolk Navy Yard. Well, when the Confederacy went to grab the Navy Yard, the captain of the facility ordered all ships burned. The Murray Mac burned to the waterline. They raised her, put her in a dry dock, and made her an ironclad. So it was basically take and grab or have ships built overseas. That's where you get the conflict between the Kearsarge and the Alabama, a naval engagement that didn't take place in U.S. waters. It took place in European. So there is no real 600-ship Navy of the Confederacy. It was basically vessels that they could take over and try to make some sort of dent into the blockade. Am I correct that the Navy was, was um, not segregated in their... In, their um... in the Civil War era you're talking about? All right. They limited the number of African Americans prior to the Civil War to 5%. Now, during the Civil War, that... They served together on the ships. Pretty much. Did they do that in the Army, too, do you know? The Army, that's a separate category. Uh, they were segregated. That is one of the interesting things about the Navy, but keep in mind the environment you're in. How in the world are you going to segregate these men and walk the decks of the Constitution? There is no room to do it. 
So there weren't just Afro-American ships. You had a mixture of people, various ethnic groups. Is that still, that's always true in the Navy? Uh, it, it depends upon the time period you're talking about. Any further questions? All right, I'll let, thank you, Bill, this was wonderful. Thank you.